also put one finger in Luke chapter 19, because that's where we're going to be going uh, in a little bit here. All right, Zechariah chapter 9. All right, amen. It's good to be saved. It's good to be in church. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Zechariah writing, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just in having salvation, lowly in riding upon an ass, and upon a colt the bow of an ass. Let's pray. Father, again, it is good to be saved and it's good to be in church. And Lord, we ask you to bless the message. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Now we see here, O daughters of Jerusalem. And uh, Brother Aldwin, he sang that song, Jerusalem. Now this isn't in the message. Uh, God's giving me a little something right now. But what's in the middle of Jerusalem? The word, the letters, U-S-A. I believe God has a sense of humor. And uh, yeah, and someone's laughing. <laughs> and, uh, but why do you think our country has been blessed for hundreds of years? Because our country has... Uh, for the most part, we're not perfect people, but for the most part, especially the church, has supported, Israel has supported the Jew. All right, now the church doesn't always have a good history. Both the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church in medieval times uh, persecuted Jews, and uh, they, all per they all persecuted everyone. But if you fast forward to the modern day, uh, I believe that one of the reasons why we're blessed is because uh, we, 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 don't, we don't persecute the Jews. We bless them, the Bible says bless them, that blessed thee. And we try to bless them. Uh, we live with, with a lot of Jewish people. My accountant, he, nice Jew, got me a nice refund yesterday, got my taxes done. My doctor, he's Jewish. I, I love going to Jewish delis. I, I'm a happy guy. And uh, I don't, you don't mess with them. One, they never lost the war. Okay. Two, look what happened to Egypt, Germany, Russia. Anytime a country messes with them, God, you mess with the Jew, you're messing with God. I'll just leave it at that. So, anyway. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just in having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the plow of an ass. Now, today we celebrate uh, Palm Sunday. And uh, I kind of preach this message more or less the same every year because there's really, there's, there's a couple of New Testament accounts, and this is the Old Testament prophecy here. Now, Palm Sunday is a movable feast that falls on the Sunday before Easter. And you say, what is a movable feast? A movable feast is a religious holiday that falls on different dates uh, on different years. In other words, we celebrate Christmas every December 25th. Is that a uh, movable feast? No. No, okay, that's right. That's right. Not a trick question. It's always on the 25th. But the date moves, it's movable, uh, each and every year. Uh, and what's the reason why Easter and Palm Sunday change every year? Uh, because, uh, now we're going to get a little technical here, and I'm going to sound like a high school teacher, you probably fall asleep, but uh, Easter is based on the lunar calendar. The lunar calendar is celebrated based on the cycles of the moon, right? Lunar, moon, okay? And it's the cycles of the moon's phases. Uh, Easter is scheduled to fall on the Sunday that follows the full moon uh, that happens on or after March 21st. So after March 21st, when you see that big old full moon, the next Sunday is going to be Easter, which is also known as the uh, spring equinox. And Palm Sunday always comes a week before Easter. Now, trick question, I, I'm sure Don will get this, uh, I know I ask this every year, but uh, I don't know. Uh, do we, now is this based on the Julian or the Gregorian, Gregorian calendar? Which calendar? Gregorian. Which calendar do we live in? That's right, you know that one. The answer, we, we live in the Gregorian calendar. The Gregor, uh, Gregorian calendar is based on the solar calendar, and the solar calendar is a calendar whose dates indicate the season uh, or almost equivalently the apparent position of the sun. So we got different things going on. We got one thing on the moon, one thing on the, on the sun, and you know, uh, the Gregorian calendar is widely accepted as the standard in the world, except for a few countries, uh, and, and an example of a solar calendar. And the Julian calendar was proposed by Julius Caesar uh, in 46 BC, uh, BC to reform the old Roman calendar. Uh, it's really not 
uh, used that much. Uh, currently, the Julian calendar is 13 days behind the Gregorian calendar. And the Gregorian calendar uses a more accurate leap year formula, making it far more uh, accurate than the Julian calendar. Uh, however, it's not perfect. It's off by a day every 3,236 years. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's why, that's why we celebrate Christmas on the twips. Uh, other churches celebrate it in January. That's just because they use a different calendar. Anyway, uh, for you st uh, statisticians, last year, Palm Sunday was uh, March 28th. Today, it's April 10th. Next year, it's April, 20, uh, April 2nd. In 2024, we have March 24th. That's an early one. And then 2025, April 13th, kind of a late one. So you learn something new every day. You probably like to get it all anyway. So, but anyway, let's go back to Palm Sunday. On Palm Sunday, we celebrate the triumphal uh, entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem the week before his death, burial, and resurrection. Palm Sunday marks the beginning of Holy Week, uh, or Passion Week, which concludes on Easter Sunday. In many churches, uh, Palm Sunday is marked by the distribution of palm leaves. We have them in the back, and you're going to go home with the palm leaf today. And I know somebody somebody did that last year, and I left it on the little light switch. Somebody made a little cross out of the, you know, the, the, the palm leaf. So if you're like a little, you know, I don't know, basket weaver or cross weaver, you know, you can make one, put it, I'll put it there. I, I found it. I'm like, that's pretty cool. Right? Someone's uh, paying attention to the message. No, they're making a cross out of a, out of a, out of a palm leaf. And we've got our little fake palm trees over here. Which they're, they, they're never going to die. They're doing good. And anyway, but... Uh, we give out our, our distribution of palm leaves uh, uh, to the church folk here. All four Gospels all record Jesus' uh, triumphal entry into Jerusalem and, uh, and takes place in the days before the Last Supper, marking the beginning uh, of his Passion Week. Now, why do we call it Palm Sunday? All right, if you, uh, you know, if you, uh, if you don't have to go there. We're, we're going to go to Luke, te uh, Luke 19 in a few minutes. But if you read in John chapter 12, uh, verse 13, where John records the event, he writes, On the next day, much people that uh, were come to the feast when they heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king uh, of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And that's kind of neat that, you know, you have four gospel writers, and each one kind of picks on a different nuance and a different part of the, the story. And John here records that they took off branches of palm leaves, and they met, went forth to meet him. So they ran around with palm leaves. Apparently that was like the, you know, we have pom-poms, cheerleaders and stuff. So that was the mod, that was their thing. That's what palm leaves uh, were used for. Now let's turn to Luke chapter 19 here. And this is where we're going to spend a bulk of our message here. And we're going to look at verses 28 to 44. We're kind of, you know, rapid fire, you know, real fast, uh, explain them. Now, in Luke chapter 19, uh, we have a lot of things going on here. We have, a, we have symbolism. We have types, pictures. We have straight up uh, doctrine going on here. And let's start reading here. Now, first of all, Jesus first instructs two of his disciples on where to go and how to obtain the young donkey that has never been ridden before. All right, so look at verse 28. Uh, and, it came, and, and when he had thus spoken, he went before, sending up to Jerusalem. Uh, and it came to pass uh, when he was come nigh to Bethpage and Bethany and the mount uh, called Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. Uh, you know, just a side note here, I say this every year, but if you know the town of Bethpage in Long Island, uh, that's where we got the Beth page, and Beth page means what? Fig. Fig. Figs. That's right. It's like house of figs. All right. Yeah, just love those fig Newton cookies. No, I don't know. My mom bought them when I was a kid. I don't know. I know a lot of people grow figs, but the Lord says here in verse thirty, He says, "Go," He's saying, "Go ye into the village uh, over against you, in the which." At your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him, and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do uh, ye loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And when the disciples, uh, you know, and when, when he told the disciples to get the donkey, Jesus referred himself to what? 
the Lord. All right? That's a proclamation or a doctrine of Jesus' divinity, that Jesus is God. The Greek word kurios is the equivalent of the Hebrew Adonai, and it means Lord. Now, Jesus Christ is Lord. He is God. Everything said about God in the Old Testament is also said about Jesus in the New Testament. Uh, God is the Lord of Lords. Psalm 136, verse 3 says, O oh, give thanks to the Lord of Lords, for his mercy endureth forever. And in Revelation chapter 19, verse 16, we read, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written thereof, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So before Nike and all those sweatpants companies put their little logo on the sweatpants, all right, the Lord did it first. He has on his pants. King of Kings, Lord of Lords. God is the creator. Okay, uh, what's the first verse in the Bible? Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Right? Colossians 1.16, Jesus is the creator. Uh, Colossians 1.16, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, or principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Right? God is the only savior. Right? He's the only one that can save your soul. Isaiah 43, 11, I even I am the Lord, and besides me there is uh, no Savior. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, uh, chapter 2, I see me chapter 1, verse 10, Paul writing to the church, but now, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. God is the Alpha and Omega. That means the first and the last. Isaiah 44, 6, Thus saith the Lord, King of Israel, and Redeemer of the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, and besides me there is no God. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8 says, I am the Alpha and Omega, speaking of Jesus. Uh, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. That's some heavy-duty stuff. Uh, Old Testament prophecies, uh, prophecies foretold that Messiah would be God. All right, what's the Christmas story? Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, uh, the Prince of Peace, uh, the Everlasting, uh, excuse me, uh, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Right, Isaiah, Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself, uh, himself shall give you a sign, behold, a virgin, shall conceive and bear a son and shall call him Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. All right? So we have a lot of, you know, when, when you hear people, I know it's even bugging me too, sometimes like I watch the History Channel, some TV shows, and they'll do a documentary about Jesus, and I'm like, wow, this is cool, let me watch it. And they'll always, they'll always interview some like theologian from a liberal theologian school, and the first thing, ah, Jesus isn't God, he was just a nice man, I'm like, I'm clicking this thing off, I'll do, throw the remote at the TV, and you know, write a letter to this guy, like, you don't know what you're talking about, and then you're disregarding like hundreds of Bible verses here. Uh, Hebrews 1.8 says, God the Father speaking to the Son, he says, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, a scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. So even God the Father calls God the Son, God. I believe that this is uh, important that we should learn these things. The New Testament writers said that Jesus is God. Uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All right, and that's what, that's what we're going to be studying in a couple of weeks. I'm getting excited. We'll spend some time uh, on that verse, just John starting off his gospel. All right? Paul writing in uh, 1 Timothy 3.16, and without controversy. See, this city shouldn't even be a controversial, debatable thing. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. What does that mean? That's the Christmas story. God was made flesh. He was made a baby, justified in the spirit. All right, that's, you know, Jesus getting baptized in, the Holy Spirit came upon him, seen of angels, preaching to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. That's the resurrection. Titus 2.13 says, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, again, John writes in, in 1 John 5.20, uh, 
And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him is true. Even the Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. I mean, that's wild. A lot of people don't read little First John there. Other Bible uh, writers said that Jesus is God. Isaiah called him God. David called him God. Jeremiah called him God. Matthew called him God. Uh, Jesus Christ himself called himself God. All right, the angels called him God. Elizabeth, John, uh, John the Apostle John, the blind man who was healed. Thomas called him God. Peter called him God. Paul called him, called him God. And again, God the Father called him God. And you know what? Jesus is the righteous God. Now going back to Luke here, chapter 19, and he says here, And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they went their way, and, and found even as he had said unto them, and as they were loosing in the cult, the owners thereof uh, said unto them, Why lose uh, ye the cult? And the Lord's, and they said, The Lord hath need of him. Now imagine you're the owner of that cult, you know, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a cult, he's, for some reason he, he, he's kept it so no one has ever ridden him, he's got it tied up, and two strangers come around and like, you know, loosen the thing, and they're about to take him, and they go, hey, 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 my donkey here. And they say, the Lord hath need of him, you know? Uh, you know, imagine, uh, you know, imagine I go to your house, and you know, you, you left your keys in your car, and I'm going to take your car, and uh, you know, say, why are you taking my car? Say, well, Pastor Hank needs the car. Yeah, it doesn't work like that, okay? But when the, yeah, I wish I, you know, why are you taking my money out of the bank? Oh, Pastor Hank needs uh, the money. No, no, no. But when the Lord wants something, you know, it has an effect. Man usually takes things by robbery, and covetousness, and stealing, but the Lord does it because of his divinity. And they said, the Lord hath need of him. And he said, fine, take the donkey. And in verse 35, uh, Jesus starts his triumphal entry. And they brought him to, uh, to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereof. So they put, you know, maybe a coat or two for Jesus to sit down, you know, feel a little comfortable here. Now the symbolism here, we see the symbolism of the donkey. And this refers to the Eastern tradition that the donkey is an animal of peace. peace. That's right. It's an animal of peace. Versus the horse, which is the animal of war. war. Exactly. You know, that's the, so when Jesus is going to ride his donkey, he's coming to Jerusalem not to want to make war, but he wants to make peace. A king would ride upon a horse when he was bent on war and rode upon a donkey when he wanted to point out that he was coming in peace. Jesus' entry would thus symbolize that, that he is the king of king, lord of lords, but he is also the prince of peace. Jesus' purpose of riding into Jerusalem was to make public his claim to be the Messiah and king of Israel, and thus fulfilling Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, our, our, our opening text in, in, in fulfilling that Bible prophecy, which says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, O shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, having salvation, lowly riding upon an ass. All right? And in verse, so that fulfilled that right there. That's, that's, that's a good thing. We see like Bible prophecy being fulfilled. And in verse 36 we read, And he went up, they spread their clothes in the way. Uh, spreading one clothes in the path of another, again, is a Middle Eastern uh, tradition, Jewish <coughs> custom, that was commonly recognized as paying homage uh, to the king. All right? When the king would ride into town, people would take their jackets or their coats, or, and they'd throw it on the, on the ground in front of the king, and that was, a pay, that was a way of paying respect and paying homage to the king or another type of royal person. Uh, an example of this is found in the Old Testament in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 13. We read, Then they hastened and took every man his garment and put it under him on top of the stairs and blew trumpets, saying, Jehu is king. All right, here we have King Jesus entering Jerusalem, and people are waving some palm branches, people are taking their jackets, they're throwing it in front of him while Jesus is riding on the horse, and, and, and people are getting very uh, excited and festive. 
Now, the palm branch was a symbol of triumph and victory in the Greco-Roman culture uh, of the Roman Empire, which uh, Israel was part of the Roman Empire at that time. When a victorious general and his army would return home from a glorious victory in, in battle, they would lay down palm branches and wave palm branches uh, to show, uh, again, respect to the victorious army. Um, when we, what do we do today? We do the same thing. All right? When the Mets won the World Series in 1969 and when the soldiers came home after the war and after the astronauts landed, uh, you know, uh, on the moon, uh, what do we do? We don't use palm branches, but we use confetti. We throw ripped up paper and that's, hey, victory, victory, hey, the astronauts made us. And in verse 37, we read, King Jesus starts a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And when he had come, uh, and when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and, pray, and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Now let's, pray, let's break this down here for a minute here. Now the disciples are getting in, in on the thing here. And they're rejoicing and they're praising God uh, with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. You say, well, what's that talking about? Well, the disciples had just spent three years with Jesus and they had seen a lot, all right? They, they had saw uh, and read that Jesus was born of a virgin, that Jesus converted water into wine, that he healed the nobleman's son, that he would catch great uh, amounts of fish uh, that their nets would break. He healed uh, the demoniac and cast demons out. He healed Peter's brother-in-law. He cleansed the leper. He healed the paralyzed man. He healed the infinite man. He restored the hand of a man that had a withered hand. Now, a withered hand is someone... Uh, actually, I saw someone, I think it was in Florida, the last one, someone that had a withered hand. And there was a man that had a withered hand, and what did Jesus do? Yeah. I don't think old Dream Gene Prophetic can do that one, Don. I don't think so. I don't think yeah, so. I don't think so. You know, you got some of these churches, hey, the healing thing, and get on the line and throw $20 in the, in the bucket, we're going to heal you. I bet the man comes with a hand and says, uh, I don't know, uh, we're going to give you a refund. I don't think we can... Uh, I don't think they could do that one. All right? They had seen a lot of great things that the mighty works that the Lord had done. He raised the widow's son from the dead. He restored the centurion's servant. He cast demons out. He calmed the storm. He threw demons out of two men of Gadara. He raises the daughter of Jairus from the dead. He cured the woman with the issue of blood. He restored sight to blind men. He walked on water. I mean, I, I got like 50 of these. I mean, he's a, he healed the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman. He fed 5,000 people. He fed 4,000 people. He cured blind and deaf people. He healed an ep uh, epileptic lunatic boy. He had his transfiguration. He paid his tribute tax money. How? The little, the little fish, the little coin in the fish. He sent uh, Peter, I think, and John down there. You know, I mean, hey, I, I just, uh, <laughs> I hate talking about it. I just sent the county last month like $7,500 for the school tax. I mean, I'm like, Lord, can I go down to the lake, get a little fish, strangle the thing, and pull out $7,500? Woo! I like the, that's, that's a good way to pay taxes. He healed ten lepers. He opened the eyes of a blind man. Raised Lazarus from the dead. Cured a man with the dropsy. Restored the sight of two men uh, near uh, two blind men near Jericho. They had seen a lot of mighty works, and they were the disciples. They were getting they were getting excited, and that's good. You know, the disciples were following the Lord, and they had something to shout about. Hey, he's the king, he's the Messiah, he's God. We've been with this guy for three years. We've seen a lot of mighty works that he has done, and they're, woo they're shouting it out. The apostle John would go on to write in John 21, verse 24, this is, disciple, this is the disciple which testified these things and wrote these things that we may know that his testimony is true. And there are many, also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. 
So, I mean, John, wrote, John Riswell wrote 20 chapter book. He's saying, hey, he, Jesus did so many things that they couldn't record them all. Jesus is the righteous God. He is the miracle worker. I right, going back to Luke 19, 38, saying, Blessed is the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. Right? Jesus is God. He's the miracle worker. Jesus is the king. Blessed be the king. All right? Jesus' kingship was prophesied. Our, our opening text, Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh. Jesus was born a king. Luke chapter 1, verse 30. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive uh, in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall be called great. He shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord shall give unto him a throne. All right, the only one that gets to, gets to sit on the throne is the king. All right? The devil never going to sit on that king because he's not more than a court jester. And he's heading out to hell. He's never going to touch that throne. The throne is only for the king, Lord Jesus. He was born a king. They mocked him as king. Matthew 27. All right? They had planted a crown of thorns and put it upon his head. And a reed in the right hand, they bowed the knee before him, mocked him, saying, Hail, king of the Jews. And we have our little crown of thorns right over here. They mocked him as king. They crucified him as king. And, and uh, Pilate in Matthew 27 said over his head this accusation, accusation written. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. And right now, King Jesus is sitting on the throne on the right hand of the Father. Hebrews 1.3, who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person and upholding all things by his word, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So we have the we have the Father sitting here, and on the right we have the Lord Jesus. And you know what? Uh, we might be in these last days, and you know what? Jesus is coming back as king. Revelation chapter 19. We read, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon it was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and head were many crowns, and in a name written that no man knew it but he himself, and was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed upon him white horses, clothed in fine linen, and white and clean. The Lord's coming back as king, and you know what? He's coming back uh, via the King's Highway. Now, when I talk about King's Highway in Brooklyn, where I used to work, but in Isaiah chapter 35, we read, And on a highway shall there be, and the way it shall be called the way of holiness, and the unclean shall not pass over it. For it shall be those wavering men, though fools shall not err in. The devil's got the lost going uh, on a highway. And it's, uh, and it's called the highway to hell. But while King Jesus travels on the, king, high, the king's highway, Jesus is the eternal, immortal king. Uh, 1 Timothy 1.17, Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, uh, be honor and glory forever and ever. Jesus is the all-powerful king. Jesus is the king of kings. Now, continuing in our story here, we'll, just, uh, we'll go to Matthew 21, verse 9, where we read, and the multitudes that went forth before uh, and followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now we sang that song, but do you know what Hosanna means? Praise the Lord. And a rare, a rare, min minus 400. Oh, man, luckily we weren't on Jeopardy. You know, like the Daily <laughs> Double or something there. <laughs> oh, man. Done. Re oh. Hosanna means save now, or save I beseech ye, which is a fulfillment of prophecy in Psalm 118, which says, save now, I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna. I beseech thee, uh, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Uh, we have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. Right? Jesus saves and it's, it's prosperity. 
And that sort of concludes our story here. We know the rest of the story. We have the triumphal entry. Um, the, the Jewish religious leaders eventually reject Jesus. We have the Last Supper. The, we have his passion. And then we have the death, burial, and resurrection, which we'll be uh, preaching on uh, next week. Now, actually, there's one more point I want to bring out, which is part of, uh, which is part of the um, Zechariah 9, uh, 9 chapter, uh, chapter 9, verse 9. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, he is just, having salvation. Now, that's an important part. Jesus is the righteous God, the miracle worker, the king. He has salvation. Salvation is what accompanies his work. Jesus came to what? Seek and save that which was lost. And if you want salvation and you want to be saved, then you need to accept Jesus Christ, the righteous God, miracle worker and king, having salvation as your personal Lord and Savior. Now, you want salvation. You want eternal life. You want to see God. You want to be in heaven. You want to have a mansion. It all starts with accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord. And what are you going to do today? Do you accept him as Lord, lay your coat and palm branches in your life before the Lord and serve him? You're going to shout out, Hosanna to the Son of David, blessed is he that cometh in the Lord. Or are you going to be like the world and reject him? Remember, the king is coming. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, thank you, church. I'm going to ask uh, Brother, um, Brother Gordon if you can come on up and pray. And a uh, nice kind of short prayer there, buddy. And uh, no 12-minuteers there. We got a nice lunch to, to go. Come on up and pray.